I feel that we finally live in a time where it's now okay to say that I happen to love the B-movie camp of the first three Resident Evil games. Sure. Everyone, including myself, has taken their turn getting easy licks in, comparing them unfavorably to Silent Hill, parodying the dialogue, and so forth, but that's only served to make them more endearing and maintain their relevance. Resident Evil was one of the only games that properly felt like a so-bad-it's-good horror movie, a vibe that can only be created by a delightful mix of incompetence and creativity. Just look at the original game that opened with live-action actors, all mugging into the camera with barely any direction on their characters, somehow managing to star Riley Reed before she was famous or the director's cut of that game, which replaced all the original music with noise created by an actual con artist who didn't even know how to play an instrument. That's not something you can intentionally replicate with stylistic choices. It has a certain charm that the more serious remakes now lack. The remakes have focused on removing the campy B-movie style, leaving them with only B-level plots without the camp to hold it all together. The 2001 remake of Resident Evil is no different. All of the lines about Jill sandwiches and Masters of Unlocking are gone, which is odd because in later years, Capcom leaned into those memes and has even reused them. And since I have to assume the remake supersedes the original in terms of canon, I'm left wondering how characters can make fun of Masters of Unlocking if that line doesn't even exist in this game. In regards to how Resident Evil 1 fits into the lore, the biggest thing they could have fixed was a massive plot hole written into it. Resident Evil features two playable characters, Chris and Jill. Their path through the game is roughly the same, the only real difference being which side characters they partner with, and Jill having the easier campaign due to more inventory space and a more helpful partner compared with Chris. But the canon treats both campaigns as having happened simultaneously, even though that can be the case, due to whomever you don't pick being locked up in a cell for the entire game. There's no way to rectify this issue in an easy way, so I'm going to primarily stick with Jill's campaign, but also mention any differences when playing through it as Chris. Nothing says immersive horror experience like a storyline that's a Schrodinger's cat. Resident Evil begins with Raccoon City's Star's Alpha Team searching for Bravo Team, who went missing during their investigation into a killer earlier that day somewhere in the Arkley Forest. I've never been sure why a small town police force needs two special forces units who seem to be investigating the kind of crime regular police are already perfectly suited for. This feels like one of those heavily militarized police forces that need to be seen doing something to justify their insane taxpayer expense, even if what they're doing is pointless. Bizarre murder cases have recently occurred in Raccoon City. There are outlandish reports of families being attacked by a group of about 10 people. Victims were apparently beaten. Several people from Raccoon City have been attacked and killed in a string of bizarre murders. Somehow mindless zombies from the Spencer Mansion got all the way into the city undetected, broke into people's homes and ate them, then vanished like the wind without a trace, a single witness, and they somehow avoided infecting anyone from Raccoon City with a T-virus while they were out and about. The Bravo team was sent in to investigate. Guys, the murders happened in Raccoon City. Why are you out investigating the local forest without a single lead to point you in that direction? Since you're looking for a crashed helicopter, wouldn't you at least bring some paramedics with you to treat any survivors and fly them back for emergency medical care? Great job, Jill. You dumped your entire mag and failed to hit or stop even a single zombie dog while they tore your coworker apart. You didn't even have an emotional response and just stood there blankly staring at the scene. How medicated are you right now? Brad, who so far has only heard a few gunshots, takes off in the chopper and leaves the entire team in the forest to die. And none of them brought working radios with them to signal that they need rescue. Chris, this way. Only Wesker would wear sunglasses in a forest at night and still land shots on fast-moving targets. Even with Wesker's flashlight shining directly at Chris, I'm not seeing any light on him from the beam. Humans outrunning Dobermans. Despite Jill, Chris, Barry, and Wesker all running for the mansion, one member of the team will somehow be separated right in front of the door. If you're playing as Jill, Chris is nowhere to be seen. And when playing as Chris, Barry is blinked out of reality and never comes up again. And no one seems to care despite him being the only one with children to look after. Somehow Wesker took the missing player character captive and locked them up in a cell beneath the mansion, even though he's right there in the foyer with you. Why he would do that is a bit confusing, when his goal is to test bioweapons against STARS members. Locking one up is just a waste of a test subject. What is this place? Not quite your ordinary house, that's for sure. How did you not know of an opulent mansion out in the woods that's been here for decades? That's going to stand out. Jill, no! You don't want to go back out there. You can't leave the mansion through the front door because of the dogs. No matter that there are far worse things inside the mansion, including more dogs, and eventually you'll be equipped well enough to take them out. But we've got to find... What was that? Chris? No. Jill, go and investigate. They hear a gunshot off in the west wing past the dining room, and Wesker sends you to investigate, eventually finding a dead Bravo team member Kenneth being eaten by a zombie. Curiously, Kenneth was recording to VHS tape when he died, and he fired five times in the video, but they only heard one shot, and his shotgun is nowhere to be found on his body. This order makes even less sense in Chris's campaign because he lost his gun running away from the dogs, and is armed only with a combat knife, yet Wesker sends him alone to investigate. 
blood. Did you just sniff someone's blood, you freak? Remember, Barry is a cop. Imagine him arriving at crime scenes and wiping his fingers through the blood on the ground in front of the coroner and other investigators. I bet this man has a reputation in the office. Let's see if you can find any other clues. I'll be examining this. I've got blood to look at. You go do stuff on your own. If I come back to this room and find that blood stain gone because Barry licked it clean, I wouldn't be surprised. You can kill the zombie yourself, which isn't that hard, unless you're Chris because he only has a knife at this point, but Jill can save ammo and run back to the dining room to let Barry finish it off for her, who for some reason needs three magnum rounds to kill a single zombie. And he doesn't even kill it. The zombie gets back up and politely goes back to its hallway as you leave the dining room, so he failed to kill a zombie with three magnum rounds. Wesker is nowhere to be found in the foyer when they return to report on the zombie. If you're playing as Chris, and this is when Wesker captures Jill and locks her up, which he has no reason for doing since he wants to test the bioweapons against STARS members. We can search for him separately. I'll investigate the dining room again. You're not fooling me, Barry. You want to get another look at that blood. I almost forgot. It's a lockpick. You'd make better use of it. Why would you have a lockpick, Barry, if you don't even know how to use it? Is this what you hand out as office place presents? Or something you slip onto a perp to arrest them for probable cause? Gameplay in Resident Evil sticks close to the original. You have a gun that you can barely aim, you have a camera that you can't control, and feet that you can barely control. The first wave of horror games had this misguided belief that too much mobility would make the game less scary, since, as they figured, horror came from a place of intense frustration. You can still only move or shoot, not both at the same time. And aiming is largely done for you, except for aiming up or down. Down for when enemies are crawling toward you, and up for when enemies are directly in front of you, and you want to go for a headshot but just waste ammo and miss instead. The inventory system is exactly the same as far as I could tell, with limited carrying space, forcing you to backtrack because you couldn't possibly foresee what you will need or how much room you'll need for picking up new items. The remake focused on perfecting the fixed camera angles and tank controls of the era, right as those were coming to an end in favor of over-the-shoulder aiming and full three-dimensional graphics. There are still plenty of times you had to fire off-screen at an enemy you can't see, or navigate a hallway that sees your directional control change with every camera angle. The only real change are defensive weapons for when enemies grab onto you, allowing you to save on taking damage that you would have otherwise have no choice but to accept once the enemy breathes on your hitbox. The Spencer Mansion is famously the most quirked up home ever built. The remake even expanded upon that. They took a spooky old mansion with a secret biolab under it, and added a graveyard with a demonic crypt, a shack on top of a mountain where a disfigured mutant lurks, all connected by an endless assortment of keys, sigils, cranks, missing doorknobs, crests, jewels, and keycards. Coming across this listing on Zillow is going to leave you scratching your head. What I find more questionable than the labyrinthine method of getting around is the presence of only one bathroom for all the personnel here, proving it really is a horror mansion. The dining room's upper level has a section of the banister missing so you can drop heavy statues down below to break it apart and retrieve the jewel from it, which unlocks a box of shotgun shells from a bust of a tiger. This is the same mansion that locks a shotgun behind a booby trap that tries to crush you if you take it. This is the future liberals want for our second amendment rights. Unless this shotgun has Chekhov's autograph on it, I don't see any reason to place so much security around it. Removing it from the wall will trigger the ceiling in the connecting room to flatten you if you don't first replace it with a replica shotgun. You in there? So much for the master of unlocking. That was a close one. A second late, you would have fit nicely into a sandwich. What kind of sandwich, Barry? Hmm? That line's canon, no matter what this game says. But Barry, didn't you say you were going back to the dining room to find other clues? I'm glad and all, but why are you here? I just had something I wanted to check. Anyway. I just had this idea that I should check on something nondescript and vague up here that I never bring up. Say... There wasn't any blood on the floor in there by any chance, was there? The zombie dogs don't famously burst through the windows when you go through this hallway in the east wing. Instead, they wait until you've gone through it several times. Smart move. Defy expectations, only to then live up to them. Look what I've found. What? A can of fizz. It's sure to yellow and mellow those things. I'm pretty certain acid grenades would be considered a war crime right up there with white phosphorus. So this stuff is likely highly illegal. What are the police doing with it? Don't tell me they're using that for riot control. You retrieve a dog whistle from an office with a memo explaining that the workers place a treasured object on a dog's collar. Blowing the whistle on a balcony will call the dog. The treasured object is a dummy key used only to take the place of a real key inside a trap room, where a statue full of spinning spikes will kill you if you remove it. Keys are meant to be used. It's not like there's something special in most of these rooms. They're just regular rooms. Why go to all the trouble to stop people from getting inside them? Forrest brought a grenade launcher with him on this mission to investigate the forest around Raccoon City. These guys came into the woods specked out to take on the Predator, and still got their asses handed to them by zombies. What did this to you? A big snake. And it had to be 
poisonous. Poisonous? Richard, hold on. Bring me serum. I saw some, but didn't bring any. First, it's venomous. The snake is venomous, not poisonous. Common mistake. Second, nah, Richard's dead. For several reasons. First, to counteract snake venom, you need to know the exact kind of snake that bit him and use the appropriate anti-venom. Second, the snake that bit him is the size of a truck. If the amount of venom injected scales with the snake's body size, then that snake probably injected enough venom into Richard to kill the whole state. In fact, he probably has more venom than blood inside him. The situation is the same with Chris, only you meet Rebecca here as well, who mentions that she left serum downstairs. I take it Rebecca is still relying on Resident Evil Zero's terrible inventory system, where you drop stuff on the ground and have to come back for it. I don't know why she didn't go get it if she knew where it was. She was just going to let Richard die even though she knew how to save him until Chris came along. Here's my radio. Take it. Why doesn't Jill have her own radio for a mission like this? Stars is the special forces of Raccoon City Police, yet they seem to be missing basic equipment like radios or handcuffs. Jill confronts Yon the snake and does so without any of the serum on hand that she just used to save Richard's life and then almost dies to the venom just like him due to not having any. If Chris is bitten by Yon, Rebecca will save him by running to the first aid room to get a bottle of serum, something she could have done to save Richard, but I'm sure she had her reasons. If you save Richard in Jill's campaign, he'll help you fight Yon and then make your efforts to save him pointless by getting promptly eaten. You do get his better shotgun out of it though. With Chris, you take Richard back to the save room where Rebecca watches over him and will give you a bunch of free heals since she's a team medic. I don't know why a police force would have a combat medic on their team. Field medics exist in the military because they don't have access to paramedics like the police would. Well, I guess we were right about this mansion being quite unnatural. You have a way with understatements. Where's the part that's torn off? Well, my only guess is that it was the most important part and somebody didn't want anyone to see it. Why not just destroy the file then? People who want to keep secrets usually don't want to also create intrigue by removing only the revealing information, but leave just enough to get you asking questions. Let's continue our investigation. You stay here and get attacked by a bee. I'm going to look for more blood. How do you create a door that opens if you play a specific song on a piano? And who would demand their employees learn to play the piano just so they can get around the facility? Jill knows how to play the piano just fine, so this is barely even a puzzle. But Chris will hammer on the keys and produce something akin to what a chimp would play before asking Rebecca to play it for him. The odd thing is, Chris doesn't know that this will open a secret door in the room. So he has Rebecca in here practicing her piano all night to play Moonlight Sonata correctly, just because he wanted to hear it performed. That sounded like Moonlight Sonata. It did? I think I got it. Shouldn't Rebecca have succeeded at playing Moonlight Sonata while Chris was off doing something else and already opened the door? Once you've collected all four death masks from the mansion, you can unlock the coffin inside the crypt, which is so needlessly medieval in its design, it's difficult to believe this is where researchers would dispose of a crimson head test subject instead of burning it. You need four separate masks just to unlock this thing, and they left the crest for unlocking the back of the mansion inside the coffin with it. Crimson heads are the faster, tougher zombies, who transform from regular zombies if you don't burn their corpses, and you only have so much kerosene to burn bodies with. If you're not careful and indiscriminately kill every zombie you come across in the mansion, you can fill it full of crimson heads, who make getting through it a lot harder. This is such a great mechanic for making you pick and choose when to fight that it's always saddened me that they never use it again. It was nice of the builders of this crypt to include a switch on the coffin that opens a gate once you've been locked inside. You have to really love your gun to have it placed inside your tombstone. <laughs> Jill receives a radio transmission from Barry, who's struggling against the monster that guns are ineffective against. Jill rushes to the shack, but Barry is nowhere to be seen. I guess he got away and decided not to update his situation, and they won't even have a conversation about it when they meet up later. Lisa, the monster Barry was talking about, bonks Jill on the head, knocking her out cold, then leaves Jill resting by the fire until she wakes up so she can then try to kill her. This is Brad. If you can hear me, just give me a sign. After that, Jill receives a radio message from Brad and the Chopper, who apparently didn't hear Barry or Wesker's radio broadcast, otherwise he would know they're alive down here. He's apparently flying around the mansion even though we can't see or hear the Chopper. Jill's radio doesn't work well enough to do anything but pick up his transmissions, so she can't contact him. Why doesn't Brad fly back to Raccoon City to get help instead of just flying around the mansion all night if he's getting no answer? No, that wasn't part of our deal. But it's not necessary to destroy stars. What about my family? In the guest house, Jill overhears Barry talking to someone, and pretty clearly implicates himself in all of this. For the sake of creating mystery, the person Barry is speaking to in the same room is too muffled to make out, even though Barry can be heard plainly. Chris, stop! No! Poor Richard. 
He died doing what he loved best. Dying. Barry, I heard someone talking. Oh, you heard. I think age is starting to take its toll. Talking to myself is becoming a bad habit. Unless Barry can speak in a different tone of voice that's muffled while talking to himself, that's a suppository sized pill to swallow. Where did you find a flamethrower at here, Barry? Something about that mansion still bothers me. But I think I'll stay here a little longer. We should split up again and investigate. After killing the plant, Barry says the mansion still bothers him, so Jill should go back and investigate more while he continues looking around the guest house. Maybe he spotted a blood puddle that he needs to do a 23 and me on. Before leaving, Jill runs into Wesker shooting... something. There's no bodies left behind in the hall. Bees, apparently, since there's a few on the ground after the cutscene is over. Man was just wasting ammo. Did you notice? Barry, he sounded a little flaky. Now that you mention it, yeah. Wesker's little nugget of trickery about Barry behaving strangely didn't set off warning bells from Jill's POV for him to know about Barry's behavior. That would mean he had to have run into him, just like Jill did. But Barry never mentioned finding Wesker to Jill. There's also zero reason for Wesker to cast down on Barry since the guy is working for him, and he doesn't plan for any of them to leave this place alive. Where's Jill? Thought you were with her. Yeah, I know. We got separated. I see. The only difference in this scene with Chris is that Wesker glosses over Jill's whereabouts and Chris instantly accepts it. Doesn't even bring up that Jill is out there unarmed since he picked up her handgun in the mansion's foyer. Respond! I repeat, this is Brad. Brad? Wesker really lucked out on these radios being busted so no one can contact Brad. Actually, the helicopter itself was a bit of a wild card for Wesker. Bravo Team's helicopter was sabotaged so it would crash in the woods. But if Brad hadn't chickened out, Wesker's entire plan of getting Alpha Team into the mansion would have failed because they would have flown out of here. Upon returning to the mansion, a new type of enemy appears. Hunters, who rip off Evil Dead's POV camera for their introduction. Wesker fixed the broken doorknob in the West Wing, making it easier for you to move around. He set all this up to test B.O.W.'s against STARS members, then realized there was a busted doorknob he just had to fix mid-test because that wasn't part of his plan. Never mind all the other locked doors that I need multiple keys and sigils for. In Jill's campaign, she just loots the office of a crest and leaves. In Chris's, he hears a scream and has to run upstairs where he finds Rebecca cowering for her life from a hunter. This is the same girl who just hours before fought her way through an infected train full of monsters, including a giant scorpion, a proto-tyrant, and a guy made of leeches, but is now reduced to begging Chris for help against a basic enemy. We can't stay here any longer. We have to get to the others and find a way out of here. You with me? Yes. Then I'll go ahead. Until then, Rebecca, you're on your own. Excuse me, what? That's not being with you. She almost died. Back in the day, DRM protection wasn't software installed onto your computer, but you needed a rare jewel to unlock your disc from behind a marble bust of a tiger. You have to fight Yawn again in the library. He's just as easy as the first time, but he does knock down the exact book you didn't even know you need in his death throes. Inside the book is one of two medals which opens the way to the lab. The other you find inside a similar book in an old hallway in the basement. Inside that room you find a battery which lets you fix the elevator in the courtyard so you can drain the pond which allows you to get into the caves behind the waterfall. Chris really didn't want to get wet because he could have gotten into the cave by walking through the waterfall without doing the rest of that stuff, which is probably what Enrico did. Enrico is injured and ranting about a member of STARS being a traitor. I don't know how he learned that, but if you play as Chris, he accuses him of being the traitor. I have no idea what evidence he was seeing, since there's nothing that would implicate Chris. Then someone shoots Enrico dead, and both Jill and Chris refuse to chase after the killer who was just five feet away from them. Why even protect the conspiracy at this point by killing Enrico? Knowing the truth won't stop the experiment. Enrico doesn't even know Wesker's behind it all. He accuses Chris. The tunnel is full of boulders that roll toward you once you get too close. Chris isn't roided out enough to punch them yet, sadly. Spinning tunnels aren't naturally occurring phenomenon inside caves, which means they intentionally built this section to look like a cave and made it spin for no reason other than to make getting through it more annoying for themselves. To fix the elevator, you have to assemble an ornate cylinder with Roman numerals on it by finding the pieces, then entering a code into the machine written on the cylinder itself. Can you imagine the life of a maintenance worker for this place? Jill, go check it out. We had enough surprises for one day. I'll stay here and secure our escape route in case something happens. Jill, go check on that inhuman sound I just heard. I'll stay here and sip some tea and secure our escape route in case something happens. Barry! Barry secures the hell out of that exit. I'm pretty sure elevators have a call button on both floors, so Jill should be able to send it right back down to her. There's a freight system in this cave which lets you transport a crate to the other end where you use a hydraulic press to crush it to open it. This would of course crush anything you place inside the crate, but Umbrella uses massive crates like this to transport a single flamethrower for some reason. A flamethrower that is also the key to the door of Lisa's room down here, where you find the stone ring to repair the emblem, which allows access to the room behind the mansion staircase. 
Despite just unlocking this room with two special emblems, somehow Barry is already inside inspecting the sarcophagus of Lisa's mother, looking for bloodstains to lick up, I'm sure. Start talking. Calm down. I didn't want to do it. Believe me, I can explain. If you can jam that many sentences together in the course of three seconds, then yeah, you should be able to explain. But Barry will never bother explaining this and Jill won't ask any questions either. No time to talk. Jill, hand me my gun! Didn't you mention earlier that guns are ineffective against Lisa? What good is it going to do? Lisa's mother was just a failed test subject who died. You can burn her body rather than bury her like she's a Lord of the Rings character. Leave this place up to me and go on ahead. Okay. Do you not have any questions for Barry after he pointed a gun in your face and admitted to betraying stars against his will? The lab under the mansion is powered by an extremely volatile compound that explodes if jostled. Whenever they run out, some researcher would have to refill the canister, then slowly walk it down several hallways to the generator room to restart the power, hoping they didn't blow up the entire place in the process. Did these people ever hear of a diesel generator? After using all three MO discs, you gain access to the cell where Jill or Chris has been locked up. You can't free them just yet. As per protocol, the cell doors only unlock once you activate the self-destruct, which they're not aware of, but they don't think about their partner being locked up before they activate the self-destruct later. Wesker! Thank you, Barry. Well, what do you know? Oh, don't blame Barry for everything. I hear that his better half and two lovely daughters will be in danger if he doesn't do everything I tell him to. I never understood exactly what Barry even did to help Wesker during all this. He never led stars into a trap, nor did he capture anyone or sabotage the mission. The only thing he did was save Jill's life several times. This is only proved further by the fact that Barry isn't present in Chris's campaign, and all the same events still play out without Barry's supposed betrayal. Why eliminate stars? Believe it or not, that's Umbrella's intention. The goal was to get combat data by having STARS members face the bioweapons, but both teams were largely wiped out by zombie dogs before they even reached the mansion. Of the remaining members, one was killed by a zombie, one by a snake, or a shark, and one pecked to death by crows, and Wesker had to kill Enrico himself. So was this a success or not? The things you mention are nothing. I'll burn all of them along with this entire laboratory. Barry, go up on the ground and wait there. What's Wesker's escape plan? He has no way out of here once he sets the self-destruct in motion. Even though it would mean the death of Barry's family, he turns on Wesker in Jill's campaign. In Chris's, Wesker just shoots Rebecca. But don't worry, Chris explains her survival like this. It's a good thing you were wearing your bulletproof vest. I guess Enrico wasn't wearing a vest despite being in the same unit as Rebecca and geared up even more than her. Wesker was supposed to collect the data and then destroy the facility, but for some reason decides to free the tyrant to show it off to Chris. There's no reason to be so surprised when it attacks you. It's a mindless killing machine after all. There's a medical condition where your heart can be born outside of your body. It doesn't make you a good candidate for combat or being used as a bioweapon. I'm not really sure if it's a weak point though. You can't really aim at it. Found a file in the lab. Apparently there's still a lot of tyrant virus here. We should blow this whole place up. Right. The show must go on. Chris agrees to blow up the whole place to destroy the tyrant virus, leaving it to Rebecca to start the process. Neither of them know that activating the self-destruct will unlock the cell door for Jill, which would have been really embarrassing for Chris had things not worked out in that direction. Chris and Jill somehow have a gun again after being freed. Those things are coming. I'll take care of them. They hear monsters coming and will hold them off while you go up the elevator to signal Brad. You can all get on the elevator. Zombies won't be able to use it, and I don't even see any. Chris, you just get in contact with Brad somehow. You guys really didn't have a plan for getting out of here after arming the self-destruct other than get in contact with Brad somehow. Were you willing to go up in the fireball if he hadn't decided to drop a crate of signal rockets on the helipad? Something Brad could have done hours ago but didn't. The tyrant reappears and pretty clearly takes Chris or Jill's head off with that swipe, but they survive anyway as you finish it off with a rocket launcher Brad drops for you. How's Brad dropping this stuff out of the helicopter? He's the only one in it, so he must be getting out of the pilot seat, rummaging around for equipment in the back, then dropping it out the door while no one's flying the chopper. Jill, use it! Somehow Brad clearly spoke to Jill like he was right next to her, since that line didn't sound like it came from the radio. Forest fires sweep through Raccoon City after massive explosions set off in nearby woods. Hey yeah, uh, you watched all of it. Go team viewer. Maybe you enjoyed it so much you didn't notice the like and subscribe button just waiting to be clicked. Now would be a great time for that. You can also check out my Patreon, where I post exclusive DLC and classics in videos. I sinned Silent Hill 3 just a few days ago, and I'll be working on Grand Theft Auto 3 soon. Speaking of Grand Theft Auto, be sure to vote for which of these two games you want to see next. I mean, I think we know who's going to win, but this is a democracy, and we still have to go through the process.
A big thanks to all the Goon Guild members on Patreon, and a special thanks to Azaneth the Succubus, Musical Pumpkin, Pedro, Castle Mania, Zinro, Michelle C, Yaroslav Golubev, Dennis O'Brien, Malrose, Jake B, Donald Talbot, Saint Mo, Montezuma, Tanya Kenzaki, Aaron Hines, Sky is Under, Eric Kisser, Shadow Wolf Gaming, Purple Jaeger, Church Quinones, Storm Queen Suki, S Venus, Mario Neto, Ben Hottie, Gellis, Biohazard, Ben Dimery, and Charmsy.